Well, hello again, everybody. Thank you for another um, live today. Today I am joined with a special guest. It's Michael with Next Level Consultants, and we are so excited that you are able to join us today. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce you to our group, and then let's dig right in after we do our intros about some great information I think a lot of our audience is going to love to hear about how to buy a practice. That's a little bit different subject, but there's a lot of it going around. So just do a little bio on who my guest is today. So um, Next Level Consulting, uh, Michael spent six years representing one of the largest financial institutions from Alaska to Colorado prior to founding Next Level and guided more than 220 startup offices and 200 practice transitions in the amount of time, which is quite a journey. And he really found that his passion was to help dentists navigate that process. There's a lot of complexity of launching and purchasing dental practices, and they need a lot of support. And he really recognized a hole in the marketplace when it came to the management consulting. So, you know, as corporate dentistry and DSOs continue to find success, the poor practice owners were finding challenges in growing and thriving their individual practices. So with that in mind, he started Next Level Consultants. So it's a premier practice management organization that helps independent dentists with ownership, guiding them through the very challenging process of practice acquisition and getting it off the ground rolling. Um, advises them at all stages, establishing new practice, maintaining, expanding the practice, or preparing to sell if they're at that stage of the business. And ever after having analyzed thousands of cash flow business models. He's very qualified to be speaking on this as a business strategist, advisor to healthcare, to healthcare professionals. He knows what he's talking about. So I'm really excited to hear more about his expertise and give our practices some advice here. Um, he works with owners and their teams to really clarify their priorities, their procedures, get more of an accountability. And everyone from the dentist, the hygienist, the front off, office really blending their skills together and motivating the team to find success as a group. Based on this reputation in the region, we were so happy that he was joining us. Several top dental schools have requested his expertise as represents for their students, and we're so happy to have partnered with him and work with him together. Um, and he really enjoys helping practices find that success, and he's got the passion and commitment to helping them be successful. So with all of that, we definitely have the qualifications. I'm really excited to talk to you. I was, just before we went live, I was mentioning that we did a little bit of our own research. And generally, you know, we've been in business for 21 years. And we usually see um, about, I would say, you know, one to 2% of our marketing doctors, um, attrition, they sell their practices and retire about every year. Um, I did some little quick math for 2020. And we had between five and 10% of our marketing clients sell their practices um, after COVID, after they started reopening, which I was shocked that there was that many. But there are a lot of our doctors that had been considering retirement, maybe had an associate in there or considered an associate. And some of the stresses of the pandemic and they're just like, let someone someone else do this. It's it's finally time to step away and, and let the, the young guys take over the practices. So. Um, you know, 10% was quite a, a big change. So I'm sure you've seen that in this year too. Are you seeing a lot more activity with buying practices and things like yeah, that? Yeah, Angela, it was, it was, and by the way, thank you so much for having, having me on. It, it's a pleasure to be a part of your program. I love what you guys are doing. Um, and thanks to that. That was the best intro ever. So thank you. <laughs> you I, I feel bad. I gave you a big bio and I, I wanted you to, to take what you wanted, but you, you went through the whole thing and I love that. Thank you. But, um, you know, back, back, in there. I, couldn't skip it. I know. Well, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It makes me feel kind of old, but, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, big picture. Yeah. I saw tons of practices, uh, uh tra transition, um, it was the COVID environment that I think pushed a lot of sellers into that gear of selling. And, and the, the funny thing about that, though, Angela, was I, I noticed that a lot of buyers, I didn't think buyers were going to jump into the market because they were afraid of owning a practice through the, the COVID nonsense. But actually, they, they jumped in with both feet because 
they they felt like their hours got cut they didn't right. have control of the practice some of them were doing hygiene and yeah. so they're like you know i don't want to do this i want to i need to take control of my own career and stop relying on on the uh the uh the associate position so yeah i saw a lot of activity for sure yeah i actually we have a few new practices that um had started with us in 2020 that um that's exactly the feedback i got from the, the providers was that they were an associate in a practice and when the closure hit because they were an associate or they were you know one of several associates and maybe the the low man on the hierarchy there they got their hours cut first or they were the last ones to return and they're like i need more I need more ownership in my own practice. I need to have more control over my own income, my own destiny as it is. So that's kind of the feedback I got from a lot of the new practices that we're working with is that um, they didn't want someone else to tell them they couldn't work because they it was too many providers and there was some scary times at spring of 2020 here. We're hoping we're not going to get a rinse and repeat in 2021, but we're going to move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, let's not jinx it and move on right, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about buying a dental practice. How would you advise someone who's interested in buying a practice? What are the first steps they should look at to purchasing a new practice or or really going out on their own? Yeah, I, you know, I, I talked to a lot of buyers uh, over the over the years, and I have found that uh, there, there's really three things that they need to, to do before entering into the scene of finding the right practice. Um, and, you know, big picture, uh, you know, not to, not to stay generalized here, but it, but it really is true. You got to know where you will, where you want to practice. Um, uh, too often I, I find buyers that they, they just kind of want to look everywhere because they're looking at for the best opportunity or maybe for the practice that's spinning off the most cash, you know, uh, they're very business focused, maybe money money driven, which is totally fine. That's what we're that's what we're doing here. We're trying to make money. But uh, if someone's too broad about where they want to practice, and we start looking at practices, they find that practice that might be in an urban setting or maybe a rural setting. We start getting into negotiations, and they start getting cold feet. They're like, I I don't want to live in the middle of the boondocks, right? And so, right. really know where you want to be. Of course, you got to think about your non compete. Um, but, you know, get clear about the type of practice you want to have, where you want to uh, live, where you want to settle, where you want to raise a family, all that good stuff. So that's that's the obvious first step. Uh, the second step, I would say, is just have a conversation with a lender. The lender really can't do anything with you until you bring them a practice. Um, I was a lender, like you said, uh, for many, many years. And uh, you really do want to see if you can get qualified in the first place. Lending has changed uh, quite a bit since COVID. Um, I could say some generalized statements about what lenders are looking for today, uh, but it's changed since COVID. So you do want to talk to them uh, and just you know see what they're looking for before they lend you some money. That's that's step two in my opinion. Um, and then step three, it, it really is get on get on the market or, or or start hunting for practices, and you can do that a few different ways. Um, the most common way, of course, is reaching out to all the practice brokers. And 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 by the way, a uh, little pro tip here, um, you don't just want to talk to the brokers. You, you really do want to be their best friend um, because most of these practices are selling before they even get to the broker's website. Um, and the only way to get in position to find a practice before it goes to the website is to be best friends with that broker. And there's usually, you know, three, depending on the market you're in, three to, to 10 brokers in one market. And don't forget those brokers that only do a few deals a year because they can they, they have good practices too. Of course, everybody knows the brokers that have 15, right. 20 listings to send you, um, but you need to be talking to all of them because you just never know where, where that one practice uh, that fits you perfectly is going to come from. Um, so brokers is, is, is the obvious reason or the, the obvious step, but also get involved with your community, your, so your association, talk to your friends, talk to folks like me, CPAs, attorneys, uh, you name it because you'll, uh, Pat e Patterson shine reps, right? You just never know where you're going to find that opportunity. Um, think outside the box, uh, and just kind of go grassroots with it to, to try to find that practice. So, um, so yeah, that's, 
that that those are the first three steps uh, location banking and then you know uh, approach the 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 brokers and and community leaders in the industry right i think you answered this pretty well but let's just talk for a second more on the best ways to find that practice to buy so you mentioned a lot of those but i really liked you your point there of grassroots i know that one of the practices that um was a one of our clients that sold um the doctor who was introducing me to the new provider said that she um, was considering selling and someone approached her because she had told, you know, a, a colleague and basically word of mouth, her buyer came to her before she ever even got to the process of officially putting on the market. So um, what you're saying is kind of grassroots going back to relationship building um, is not dead in 2021. That's still something that's important. So do you have any additional kind of tips other than obviously the the brokers or the agencies are the the no-brainers. Everyone can find those. But what are some what are some grassroots relationship tips that you might um, recommend they do also to either find or if they're selling to get the word out? Yeah, no, uh, uh, Angela, I, I would say the best practices come from uh, your connections. It, it really is who you know, not what you know. And I love that you said that in 2020, relationships matter. They they really do matter in this in this case. Um, I, of course, talk to the brokers. Be calling them very regularly. Be emailing them. Get they you they need to know your name. Okay, so so that's 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 the the brokers. You don't want to earn the reputation of a tire kicker or someone that's looking for the unicorn practice, which oftentimes the brokers can kind of pigeon pigeonhole people to that reputation. Right. Uh, I think they I think buyers can get misunderstood uh, really quickly. But that being said, you know, the statistic holds true. Fifty percent of acquisitions uh, happen outside of a practice broker. They, they call them FISBOs for sale by owner. So FISBOs are 50 percent uh, uh, of the market. And, and how do you find FISBOs? Well, you you talk to CPAs. They have relationships like you guys have relationships with clients and and it's whoever is having conversations with older doctors that are in their twilight years of their career those people are in in, in a place of influence with those particular doctors consultants like myself uh we know of doctors that are contemplating and if they find you mr buyer miss buyer that is the perfect fit. In fact, Angela, you and I had a, had a, a, an opportunity together on one of our clients and she wasn't ready to sell, but she found that perfect buyer and she went ahead and moved forward with the acquisition because guess yep. what? You might not find that buyer again. And so right. again, th those relationships are so important. You could always, uh, another pro tip, could always do a direct mail, uh, actually handwriting uh, folks in the area that you want to buy uh, and saying, hey, I, I'm a young dentist I'm thinking about buying a practice. Here's my qualifications picture. Here's what I look like. Right. Like uh, uh, it's it's a way to to reach out and do a handshake without really knowing somebody. And I've, I've found a lot of success there, too. So so I guess the the natural uh, way uh, is the practice brokers. But the the network doing uh, mailers, um, uh, associations, when they're doing their, it's kind of difficult with COVID where they used to gather, you know, on a <laughs> monthly basis, <laughs> right. um, you know, that that's, start networking. The, those that network the best always find opportunities. That's the, that's just how it goes, so. Yeah, I think that's great. And the, some of the feedback that, you know, obviously it depends on the practice, but like you mentioned, some of those providers who, are considering selling and are have had their established practice for years. They are towards the end of their career. Um, you know, some of them are interested in going through a bro broker and just selling their practice. But I know that a lot of them that I've personally spoken to are really looking for the right fit because they have such relationship with their patients and they are not just going to sell to someone who can write a check. They want the um, connection on an emotional and a values level before they'd even consider selling to them. So I know that at least some of the um, practices that we work with, and we do work with a, maybe a few more of the custom custom type practices, but still they want the right fit to take care of their patients because they built this for so long. Yeah. 
Um, so tell me what are some of the pitfalls that you see? Can you give any warnings of how someone can um, maybe avoid the top three pitfalls in buying a practice or taking over a new practice? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Thank, thanks for asking. I, m with that question, my brain's kind of sparking on a hundred different things that we've, we've been fortunate enough. We were a part of 27 deals last year. Um, and, and I'm kind of summarizing just kind of the things that we experience in, in those deals. And um, I guess if I were to pinpoint the top three, it's difficult to do. Uh, the, fir the first one would probably be don't get over your head clinically. You know, as, as, a, as a buyer's agent or someone that helps buyers transition, I'm looking at numbers. I'm looking at the strategy. I'm looking at, pit, uh, you know, potential uh, uh, landmines uh, from the business perspective. But what I can't do, what your CPA can't do, what your attorney can't do, your banker, your team, what your team can't do for you, is they can't tell you if you're going to get into some trouble here clinically, right? And I'll, I can't tell a, a dentist if they can handle endo or if they can handle. So really pay attention to the clinical part because we've been a part of some transitions where you know the seller was a little bit more aggressive than the buyer. And so all of a sudden I did all of the number projections and the cash flow and I did I did my job, but when the doctor went in, the production went down and how was I supposed to know if they were speed was fast enough or if they could do implants or not do implants. And so right. you know that's something that your team, you, me, attorneys, we can't we can't do that. You have to do that, right? And so that chart audit is very, very important. That night, that one night that you get to go into the computer, look at the schedule, look at the charts, read the notes, look at the x-rays and really decide if you and that seller are a fit clinically. Because the numbers could be great, but clinically it might not be. So that's probably pitfall number one that none of your team can help you avoid. Right. Um, Number two, in this environment, I, I already alluded to this earlier, Angela, like the banks are being a little bit tighter on the money. And right. so one of the pitfalls that I'm thinking of is undercapitalizing the deal. And what I mean by undercapitalizing is if they don't give you enough money, they as the bankers, then you might not have enough money in working capital for marketing, for uh, hiring maybe a, a, an additional team member that you might need. And a lot of transitions, we needed a hygienist. Hygienists are going for top dollar these days. Right. If that wasn't factored into the cash flow, you're gonna need extra extra money. Uh, marketing is a big thing. Um, you know, a lot of these older docs, they, as you know, they weren't doing the things they needed to do to grow. They were just kind of hanging out. Right. And the buyer can't afford to do that. They have a loan <laughs> right. now. Uh, and so growth is a big thing that they need to think about when buying a practice, uh, a very good loan that gives them enough money to A, buy the practice, uh, but B, have enough money to propel you into success post-close. So that's probably number two, under under capitalization. And then probably the, the third thing is probably another one of my favorites is there's so many books and podcasts and influencers in the market that talk about don't make the team mad, make them love you, make them hug you. And you, <laughs> you know, it's a big kumbaya type moment. And it is, it's very important. You don't want to upset the front office gal because she could leave you and that's goodwill, right? right. Hygienist, that's goodwill. You don't want to upset the apple cart. So you, you, you go into that transition thinking I, oh, I want, they, everybody's got to love me, right? Well, that's a pitfall in itself because if you don't, there's a way of being very nice, but at the same time, you have to be the leader of the practice. They can't, they can't jump all over you. You have to take ownership and you have to be a leader, but at the same time, you got to get them to like you. And there's a, there's a, there's a balance there. I've seen too many transitions where people go in and they just let their team run all over them. They're calling the shots. 
And that's not a good way to start a business relationship with your team. They're still expecting you to be the leader. They're still expecting you to be the clinical, uh, the clinical leader uh, and the owner. But at the same time, you got to be nice and you can't be that dictator. But right. you do got to say, hey, this is our clinical philosophy. This is the way our schedule is going to look, the, you know, and they will follow you. So don't, don't be afraid of, of planting and sharing your vision with the team and and leading them it's different than what they were used to you might lose some people i know but i will tell you that the majority of them will follow you they'll be excited about the next step of the practice it's okay to lose some people if they're not on board with your vision in fact in a lot of ways sometimes that's actually pretty healthy because you're turning the leaf uh the you don't want to lose the whole team that's right for sure so the, I guess those would be my three things. You know, don't get over your head clinically. Don't undercapitalize the deal. Get the right loan structure and be prepared to be a leader, not a follower day one. I guess those would be my three. Those are those are great. And especially the, the team part, I can see the challenge of that because that is kind of a, a tightrope because you don't want to you don't want to replace the entire team and have the patients, um, you know, lose patient retention because they're too upset by everyone is gone, but you also don't want to walk in and just be a doormat and have the team do status quo because that is why the provider sold. I mean, there was something that made them decide that it was no longer financially profitable for them and they sold. So That's the, right. I'm sure that is um, that is a, a fine line you're walking there. So, so what I'm hearing is you want to meet the kids before you continue to date the parent to some degree too, huh? Ah. <laughs> That's what, that's what I'm hearing. Beautiful. It's, that's it's right. Get inside the office a little bit and meet the whole team before you sign on the bottom line. But that, that's uh, I think exactly this is right. great feedback. Um, you know, a lot of our audience are practices that obviously have a practice, but a lot of them are the associates who are starting to think about um, when's it time for me to have my own practice. And then, like I said, we had. A handful enough of our clients who were in that demographic that they're like it's time to it's time to let the new guys take over and it's time for me to go and enjoy my lockdown in my own solitude so <laughs> we have an audience that is doing the transition on both ends both building their own practices and um maybe letting theirs go to some degree so um yeah. i appreciate you taking the time to help us and kind of guide them through that we're gonna make sure we have your contact information up for any of the listeners out there who either you know are the providers who are looking to start a new practice or maybe even the clinical staff that you've heard the associates in your practice you've heard um other colleagues say that so and so is is going to be looking to buy a practice we'll put your information up so they can get some expert guidance during the the process because just those three pitfalls you mentioned there's a lot of things to consider it's it's not for the faint of heart so they have to be able to really um, have everything lined up and be prepared for success if they want it to be successful. So That's right. we will really appreciate your time today. I loved having you on. I think it was a great discussion and thank you so much for joining us today. It, it was it was a ton of fun and, and thank you guys for putting this program on. I, I think uh, doctors need as, as many resources as possible and uh, you guys are a, a great organization. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.